Thank you for everyone who's tuning in. We miss seeing you in the Barbara Osher Theater, but we're really very happy that you found us here um, to see BAMPFA's Watch From Home live stream conversation and Q&A for Rick Burns' wonderful documentary, Oliver Sacks, His Own Life. This is a remarkable portrait of one of the great public intellectuals of our time. Indeed, Sachs was dubbed by the New York Times as the poet laureate of medicine. In addition to his contributions to science, the science of neurology, Dr. Sachs's case studies have inspired operas, ballets, and feature films, including Awakenings from 1990, that starred Robin Williams and Robert De Niro and was nominated for three Academy Awards. Rick Burns' Oliver Sacks, his own life, is a brilliant cinematic case study of the life of the great doctor, tracing his remarkable trajectory from childhood to his last days with accounts by friends, colleagues, patients, and Sacks himself. And it's a real treat to have his voice throughout the whole film. The documentary is also, also beautifully illustrated with archival foot, footage, reenactments, stock footage, location shooting, and carefully arranged photographs, manuscript, notebooks, and objects. There's a real tactile feel to this incredibly beautiful portrait. If you haven't seen it yet, you can stream the documentary via bandpfa.org, where you can also find our full lineup of Watch From Home offerings. But today, um, I'll, we're extremely fortunate to have four terrific guests with us to discuss the film, and I'll introduce them now. Director Rick Burns is a documentary filmmaker and writer best known for his eight part series, New York, a documentary film. He has been writing, directing and producing historical documentaries for more than 25 years, beginning with the PBS series, The Civil War in 1990. Since founding Steeplechase Films in 1989, he has directed numerous films for PBS and his work has won six Emmy Awards, three Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Awards, two George Foster Peabody Awards, and two Organization of American Historians Eric Barno Awards, and three Writers Guild of America Awards for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Craft for Writing. Kate Edgar, uh, began working with Oliver Sacks as an editor and researcher in 1983. She has contributed to all 16 of his books, including the recently published Everything in Its Place. And over three decades, she's traveled the world with Sacks and knew many of his patients and subjects. She is currently the executive director of the Oliver Sacks Foundation. And, and if you've seen the film, you've seen Kate in the film as well as Bill Hayes, Sachs's partner, who's here with us today. He's a, he's a writer and photographer. His books include Insomniac City, New York, Oliver and Me, and How We Live Now, Scenes from the Pandemic. He also served as a co-editor on Sachs's posthumously produced published book, Everything in Its Place. Um, and finally, our moderator today, I feel extremely fortunate that we have scientist and soprano Andrew Viscontis with us here. She holds faculty positions at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and the University of San Francisco, performs and directs opera and is a sought after public speaker. She has published more than 50 original papers and chapters related to the neural basis of memory and creativity. And her scientific work was featured in Sachs's book, Musicophilia. As the creative director of the Pasadena Opera, she directed The Man Who was, Mistook His Wife for a Hat, a chamber opera based on Sachs's famous case study. So um, Rick, Bill, Kate, and Indri will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for your questions, but feel free to submit them at any time into the chat area of the YouTube uh, stream, and then we will pass them over to our guests. So without further ado, I'd just like to thank all four of you for being here and turn the proceedings over to Indri. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, it's such a pleasure to talk about this film, this remarkable capturing of the life of a truly remarkable man. So first, I just want to congratulate you, Rick, on really portraying. I mean, it, it, you know, I had the pleasure of, of spending a little bit of time with Oliver and you captured 
exactly what it was like, um, which I think was a gift to a lot of people who really only knew him through his writings uh, to see that kind of portrayal was, was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I told at the, t at the point where one of your guests said that it's almost cliche to mention Oliver if you want to become a neurologist uh, in your entrance essay. It's like 70% of applicants do so. And I was one of those. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I was trying to decide between going into medicine and being a researcher or being a singer. And I discovered a, an anthropologist on Mars and completely fell in love with his way of talking about patients and about humanity. And so for the first time in my life, I wrote a letter to a famous person. I found his address, which was not easy at the time. <laughs> I wrote him a letter in my favorite purple pen and I was <laughs> shocked that a few weeks later I got a response back to you know this stupid little high school student who asked a stupid insignificant question and he took the time to write back in a purple marker. Yeah. Will be significant. Um, but I put that letter on my bulletin board and when I was in college studying psychology um, I, one of my mom's best childhood friends came over and she, on her way to the bathroom she saw the bulletin board and she said oh do you know cousin Oliver <laughs> of course oh my god nearly fell off my chair that was Rita Lynn wife of Jonathan Lynn who was um, one of Oliver's cousins and she was my mom's best friend growing up and I had no idea. Um, for those of you that don't know, Jonathan Lynn uh, was, you know, had famous in his own right. Uh, and so she was, she would always laugh that, you know, I was not impressed with the fact that, you know, they had dinner with Steve Martin or Eddie Murphy, but the fact that they knew Oliver blew my mind. And so when I was a grad student at UCLA studying uh, neuroscience, I was using, um, you know, this really sexy tool of recording from individual neurons in the medial temporal lobes of patients with epilepsy. And Oliver was coming to visit and Rita invited me for dinner and I was so excited to meet him. I mean, I was gonna burst with joy. And I felt like he was so gonna wanna know about like this technique and everything. And we were having dinner and he paid no attention to me. And Rita, <laughs> the, the really great, fairy godmother that she is, towards the end of dinner said, Oliver, did you know that Indre is a synesthete? Which I just discovered. I thought everybody saw letters and numbers and color, but apparently not. Uh, and he promptly got up and left the table. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. <laughs> but he came right back up the stairs with a, with a paper that he was writing or an article that he was writing for the New Yorker on synesthesia. And since then we had a really great conversation and it showed me how when I became a patient of a sort, when I, <laughs> I was interesting to him. Um, and so my first question actually was, is to Kate, as someone who spent more time than anyone with Oliver watching his interactions with patients, um, is there anything that you could add to Rick's portrayal of him in the movie that can give us a sense of how he changed when he interacted with patients versus other kinds of people. So you'll have to unmute. Don't forget to unmute, <laughs> unless Dave can do that. There we are. Um, oh boy, Rick does such an amazing job of portraying Oliver with patients and not with patients. And one of my favorite scenes is very early in the film where he's visiting uh, a man he's known for a long time at a nursing home and you just see him take this elderly man's hand in his own elderly hand and, and just very gently sort of communicate with him with touch as well as with language. Um, I, you know, I think there, it, it's easy to think that, and I know your, your experience rings very true for me because at dinner when he was surrounded by more than one or two people, he often wasn't sure how to engage um, or couldn't hear well enough or was too shy. Uh, with his patients, he was all attention. And it didn't have to be a patient with a specially exotic condition at all. He, he really accepted people 
as they came and gave them the time and the space to tell them, to tell him their own story. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember the sort of painful shyness that, that you know, and, and that Rick portrays in the film too, which is surprising when you read his writings because he is so open in his books about his personal experiences. And then to, to find out that he's actually shy is, is quite amazing. Um, Bill, I wonder if you would, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the first times that you met him and, you know, how you overcame that shyness. <laughs> well, like you, I met him via a letter. Uh, he wrote, he wrote a letter to me because he'd read one of my books and uh, I was living in San Francisco at the time and uh, I got a letter in the mail, uh, return address Oliver Sacks. And I was, couldn't have been more shocked. Um, I knew his work, I'd read his profiles in the New Yorker. And it was just this very collegial letter saying, dear Mr. Hayes, I read your book, The Anatomist and enjoyed it very much and congratulations. So um, what would you do if you get a letter from Oliver Sacks? I wrote a letter back and to my surprise, he wrote a letter back to me. So um, I later learned that this was very common for Oliver. He um, would write letters, uh, he spent time every day on correspondence, sitting at this desk where I'm sitting right now. Um, and then I later met him when I was planning to move to New York. I moved to New York, not for Oliver, but for separate reasons. And um, I did indeed find him very shy, painfully shy, but also incredibly charming, uh, eccentric, immediately adorable. Um, and as I would later learn, Oliver had the shyness, but also paradoxically this kind of extroverted personality as well. He could be quite a performer and knew how to charm an audience. And one of the things I love about Rick's film is the way he really charms the audience here in this apartment. I'm sitting now in um, the room where it happened. As I said to Rick earlier, this is where a lot of the uh, film was um, filmed, the interviews with Oliver. And uh, he had, he was surrounded by family and colleagues and and loved ones over that first week that Rick interviewed him and um, was really comfortable and sort of charmed the audience even as he spoke. You know, Rick had had uh, some kind of incredible intuition from the moment he met Oliver. Another documentary director might have said, well, we'll just set Oliver up at his desk and we'll just film him. We'll, you know, catch maybe two cameras. But Rick said immediately, we have to have an audience. We have to have people surrounding him, people who he loves and trusts. And that was, to me, just a brilliant move because it did put Oliver at his, both at his ease, but also kind of provoked him to perform. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and it was interesting watching, especially the first few scenes, Rick, where, you know, you almost see people that are part of the crew around too, which you generally don't, I mean, that's usually hidden from the audience's view. And so I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about that choice and, um, you know, kind of how you, how you made this decision to make us feel as if we are there making the documentary ourselves as well. Well, it's funny because um, this, is the, this is the project that came knocking on our door. Um, through Kate um, in early January 2015. Um, we have a mutual friend, a wonderful <clears throat> literary agent in New York who lives in the building that I'm talking from, uh, Elizabeth Kaplan, who's Kate's closest friend. And I got a call from Kate one night in early 2015 saying, um, Oliver's dying, would you come and film him? Mm. And so we piled into his apartment um, on Horatio Street a few weeks later in early February. And so it was very much the project that, you know, had come in sort of over the transom to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unlike a project which one conceives oneself and therefore kind of has a lot, have a lot of preconceived ideas and a sense of what you want to make of it. Um, and so, so we were convinced that the best way to proceed was to take Oliver where we found him. Mm -hmm. um, and after all, where we found him, was at a really extraordinary um, moment. Um, here is an 81 year old man looking back on his life, who had just written um, the manuscript of, but not yet published a remarkably candid 
autobiography on the moon, which he had not, in which he talked about things, his sexuality, his tormented childhood in many ways, um, the, the struggles of his life in a detail that he had never shared beyond a very small circle of friends. And then at the same time, in early January, 2015, he'd gotten a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So he was tremendously focused. And as Kate said, you know, he wanted to talk. He wanted to um, make a statement on, in his writing and on film. And so we piled in and that was the kind of the point of departure for the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it felt like, um, as close to cinema verite as I'll ever come. Mm -hmm. Because after all, this is a real thing. I mean, it's a story that tracks Oliver's life from 1933 to his death and after. But it's the story of a man coming to terms with his own death. And that's the cinema verite aspect of it. Yeah, and you, you know, it was, uh, I, I have to say that it was, it's very hard during a pandemic to watch a movie about death. <laughs> and when I, you know, I, I had procrastinated on watching it because so much of our day is spent managing our emotions and trying to, you know, put on a good face when things are hard. Um, and as soon as I saw Oliver come along alive on the screen, it felt like, it felt like home. I mean, it just, it felt like, cause I was such a huge fan of his, you know, and I, he was so important both in my creative and artistic and, scientific life that to have him come back after having lost him for so many years was just so amazing and then you you finish the film with this beautiful portrayal of how he died which was you know you have a Tul Gawande on there who is you know a master of being mortal but also like you know in some ways it was a master class as you as it says in the film on on how to live your last days and so extraordinary gift I mean, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, this is an atheist English homosexual Jew, um, which meant he was going to for sure become a New Yorker by way of San Francisco, um, who um, knew that this is, you know, it and no more. Mm -hmm. um, and whose sense of wonder and um, gratitude um, was enormous. And not that he was not without fears, not that he was not without tremendous foibles, mm -hmm. um, but he was so focused, everyone who knew him, uh, Kate, Billy, you know, the, the, the entire cohort of people, that he had come to a kind of a clarity and focus there. Um, and it was the, his last um, case history was in a sense going to become his own approaching death. Mm -hmm. um, and the gift that that was, you know, that, that Ren Lawrence Weschler um, said, you know, that, he, that when he got the news that Oliver had died from Kate uh, on uh, August 31st, the day after he died, that the feeling that, that Ren had was not, a, the feeling that welled up was one, not of sadness, but of gladness mm -hmm. because he had nailed the landing. Yeah. The masterclass in how to die. And I mean, I don't want to say, you know, that, that sounds so morbid, particularly in our kind of like death drenched landscape, as you were saying, but it's exactly on the contrary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nobody more and nothing, there's nobody more life affirming than Oliver and nothing more in a way life affirming you know, nothing became him more than the way he died mm -hmm. uh, in a certain way. And, you know, I think uh, uh, anyone who sort of know, knew him in his last years will, will attribute a lot of that to Bill and to Kate and the fact that he was able to find, you know, love and partnership, uh, you know, in, in such a deep way. And so, um, you know, I... I I was surprised at, a little bit at the beginning of the film when there was such a focus on all the pain uh, and it had nothing to do with dying. Um, and so I, I wondered a little bit about, uh, maybe I don't know if this is a question for you, Rick, or for Bill about kind of, you know, the leading with the, uh, the, the closeted nature of, of so much of his life, including when he introduces Bill and still like I, it cringed when he didn't say, this is the love of my life. Let me just say as a, as a segue to Billy, um, you know, I, I had read Oliver's work, not all of it, um, but I didn't know he was gay. Um, you know, nobody knew he was gay beyond a very small circle of people. So I found that out in the course of those few weeks um, leading up to our filming. Um, and so I knew, and I knew that Bill was his partner. 
Um, and uh, so there we are, and Oliver's doing that wonderful introduction, sort of both courtly and kind of mischievous at the same time. You know, and here's Kate, who's wonderful. And then he looks around and he goes like, and here's Billy. Um, and then <laughs> Billy kind of sails in from the kitchen and Billy sits down and Oliver says, and this is <clears throat> Billy Hayes and he is a fellow writer and he lives upstairs in the building um, and to whom I dedicate the book. <laughs> And you want to go like, wait a second, Billy's head is your pillow. Um, no, yeah. um, and that was very much, Bill, you know, this kind of, you know, there we are on Horatio Street in Greenwich Village. Yeah, I mean, you said you cringe. I cringe a little bit too uh, when I see that, that scene, but I love it as well because it's so accurate to the way Oliver was. Um, that was in early February 2015. He'd completed the manuscript in which he did write about his sexuality and our relationship and his love for me, but it hadn't been published yet. Mm. And it wasn't yet public beyond really that small circle gathered here in this apartment. And even then he still got clutched up and struggled to find the words to introduce me. Now, we'd been together six years at that point, so I was quite used to that. And, <laughs> and um, I was just quite used to it, as you can probably see in the scene. But um, he evolved very quickly. And by the time the book was published, he was very comfortable. Um, but that wasn't until April of 2015, and he died in August. So the window of time when we were really out publicly as a couple, as a gay couple, was quite small. Yeah. But um, thank God we had it. And um, I do love that the film accurately, realistically captures that evolution for Oliver. At the beginning of the film, he's still struggling with how to introduce me. But by the end of the film, he's able to speak about our relationship and our love in really such lovely and, and succinct terms. It's, it's just um, perfect. I mean, the, I think the film really captures it in real time. It does have that cinema verite feel. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I just don't think he could have had the kind of ending that he did if it wasn't for finding you and for maybe even having those months where, you know, thank goodness the book came out. Uh, <laughs> well, for me, one of the very interesting things about the film is the way it chronicles his entire life, including his tormented childhood and Mm -hmm. his drug addiction and his many struggles. Of course, I had heard those stories, but to see them uh, portrayed cinematically and so richly and beautifully and narrated by Oliver and uh, was, was amazing. Because in the time I knew him, he had achieved a certain level of peace and balance. Mm -hmm. And Kate, of course, had a lot to do with that as well. Yeah, so that brings me to sort of the next topic I wanted to cover, which is the the mother replacement that Kate uh, Kate was able to, <laughs> to fill in a, you know, and and repair a lot of the scars that were, uh, you know, that that were obviously a result of some of the things that his his own mother had said to him and and done, and yet she was as as mentioned in the documentary such an important writing partner on awakenings um, and you know on his in his early work um, so Kate how did you navigate the sort of complex uh, relationship that started out with you know a wet bunch of wet paper <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. with you being the most you know, other than Bill the most significant person in his life um you know, it was not without uh, a lot of stress, especially in the early days when Oliver, uh, when, you know, when I started spending time with him in the mid eighties, he was, he was more tormented than, than we, what we see in his last couple of years by far. Um, but on the other hand, he was pretty much the most interesting person I'd ever come across. Yeah. And it, it, you know, I would be exhausted after spending a day with him because my, my brain was just racing to keep up with whatever he, paragraphs he had just uttered. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure how to answer that except that, um, like, like Billy, I was just immediately attracted to him um, on all kinds of levels. I could see that 
he in many ways was preventing himself from realizing the kind of writing he wanted to do uh, mm -hmm. because he would he would be so obsessive about some, some relatively minor catastrophe in his life that it would sort of derail him for for days or weeks so i felt like the more I could help him with that, the easier it would be for him to write. Um, and it just turned out to be a really great partnership over many, many years. So one thing I wanted to ask you about was um, his tendency to footnote and how that changed over his oeuvre, right? There are some that are, you know, I mean, they're more footnote than actual text. Um, and then there are others, you know, later on, especially where the footnotes become reined in a little bit. Um, what, what, did you have to fight with him on the footnotes or is that something that, you know? Um, no, I, you know, I, it, many of his publishers, especially uh, Awakenings is, is probably the main example. Oliver loved footnotes and I loved that too. And, they were wonderful footnotes. They're not dry. They're just like whole little hypertexty passages. Um, but you're right. As, at a certain point, you've got to, it's hard to have more footnotes than actual text. So a lot of time we spent had to do with how could we put this footnote actually as a passage of text rather than calling it out as a footnote mm -hmm. and, and balancing that. But yeah, it was a struggle. Um, with certain publishers who were, who said, you know, that's it, no more footnotes. Um, and he he always thought if if it was a footnote, he could just mail it in later. You know, mm -hmm. the book would be in galleys, and he's like, well, actually, I have a few little footnotes to add. <laughs> and of course, the production people would be going crazy. Um, and I think later, when he started working with uh, the New Yorker, particularly, which of course doesn't have footnotes. <laughs> He had to really learn how to how to deal with that. And then I would say to him, well, you know, it's okay because when you put it in a book, then you can put footnotes. <laughs> so that, that sort of made him happy. Uh, but his footnotes are really wonderful. And I've, I've some, sometimes thought about making just a book of the best footnotes. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, you learn so much in them and that you kind of get lost in this other story as you go down the, you know, the, the, the foothold, footnote rabbit hole. Uh, hey, you gotta call the book, something's a foot. <laughs> right. um, but was it, I mean, was it like he would hand you, I knew he used those yellow legal pads all the time and uh, he always had a bunch of markers that he, you know, would, would, would have with him and he'd write and write. And so would you give him back like a typed up version or would you, would you give him back another yellow pad, legal pad of, of edits? Like how did, how did the mechanics work? Um, well, you know, because, and he sometimes typed, he, he was a, a furious two finger typist, but at, at the end of his life, he really went back to just his fountain pen, as you can see here. Um, in, he never touched a computer, so, in many ways, yes, I would take something like this, type it up and insert my comments. And then we would go through them bit by bit. And, and this evolved over the years, um, but it, it involved a lot of side by side, hashing through every passage, every sentence, which is not the way editors usually work. Mm -hmm. Usually an author will send you a manuscript that's done <laughs> and you'll take it away and think about it for a few weeks and write up some questions, maybe put some notes in the margin. But but Oliver wasn't really patient enough to wait for that. So we so, did a lot of side by side. Um, one of my favorite descriptions in the film that I hadn't heard before uh, was when Temple Grandin talked about Oliver as um, you know, essentially the Hubble telescope of, of neurology or humanity, you know, I can't remember exactly how she put it, but she said, astronomy is, you know, a science that is based entirely on observation. And so anybody who criticizes him for not collecting quote unquote data and simply observing, you know, is, is completely misguided. Um, I wondered, Rick, if this was something that, you know, as you were filming that, that you kind of knew and you wanted to get that out of Temple or was that something that she just offered and then that sort of helped you see Oliver in that way? Um, Cause I, I found like 
so often, especially with Temple, um, you learn about your, the brain by hearing her talk about it because she is so clear on how her brain works and how it's different from other people's. And so I thought that was just such a beautiful moment. You know, I think that the moments like that, I think emerge not because of any insight on our part, but because, you know, I think the people whose lives um, kind of render themselves as the most powerful narratives are people in whom tension is extraordinarily taught. Um, and for Oliver, so many people, that tautness is the tension of fleeing and seeking himself at the same time. So he's really drawn very, very taut as a personality. And it means that people, you know, in, in contrast to people who are not so taut, um, you know, it begin, you know, the life meanders and wanders because it has the freedom and the fluidity to do so. But Oliver is constantly moving to the edge of whatever particular situation he's in. And then just at the last moment, solving the problem and moving on to the next episode of Turmoil and Sturm und Drang. And so, you know, with that, um, it, and so he moves from home to, to San Francisco, to lovelessness, to drug addiction, to, you know, um, careerless, fired from every job he ever had to, you know, and by the time you get to, um, you know, the late eighties, you know, he's now found a career. He's invented a career, the only one he could have, um, this kind of extraordinary career where doctoring and writing are going to be woven together. So, so, but he's not getting any credit from his own profession. Mm -hmm. He's being rejected by neurologists who are saying, you're not really doing science. You're doing some form of like, you know, like left-handed, you know, subjective reportage, which is, you know, all the more unworthy for being extremely popular. <laughs> yep. Which, to which Temple says, you know, wait a second, this man is doing first level science. Mm -hmm. Where the hell else are you gonna find out about what it's like from the inside to be a Tourette'er or like Temple, someone who is autistic or like the awakenings patients, the sleepy sickness, encephalitis lethargic patients. This is data, you can get data from the MRI when they come around, but you're not gonna know what it feels like to be that. So this is primary data. So that point the Temple is making is really at a point where the next narrative of breakthrough for Oliver is to be actually getting some kind of respect from his own discipline, which had rejected him for decades, even after he had received you know, considerable literary acclaim. But he didn't want to just be you know, acclaimed for his literary work. He wanted to be acclaimed for the science, that he was seeing and understanding something. And it just happened to be a place where science and art and subjectivity and narrativity all combined. So, you know, it was really in a sense following the Geiger counter or the divining rod of that tautness of the Saxian narrative where you sort of understand, right, Temple is shedding a light on this breakthrough. And of course, even after that, there were breakthroughs to come, one of whom was with us tonight. Yeah, and I, you know, I thought it was really interesting to see the timeline of how Awakenings then chorus the movie uh, coincided with all of these oh suddenly you know the, the the neuroscience world is going to bring him on as their own and accept him because you know Robert De Niro made his portrayal famous um, but it, certainly I remember when I was a grad student in the early 2000s I didn't tell people that I was hugely influenced by Oliver Sacks who were my colleagues because I, I did feel like it would be something that you know somehow would put me into the writer box and not the scientist box and then, you know, at his 80th birthday party, which I'll never forget at the New York Botanical Gardens, um, it was full of Nobel Prize winners, but it was heavily focused on chemists and physicists, which isn't, I mean, you know, that might just be accurate because fewer, you know, people in neuroscience have won Nobel Prizes, but, you know, it, it, I, I just wondered if, you know, if this is it, 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 like how, how, whether you got any pushback from any of the neuro neuroscience people that you might have reached out to, or like whether, you know, why you picked Christoph Koch and, you know, because he worked with James Watson, presumably, and, you know, but I, I don't know, I just... I'll tell you, you know, the, the um, ambivalence remained in many quarters. 
Um, Michael Cantor, who's the um, executive producer of American Masters, who presented the, will be presenting the film this spring, reached out to a couple of scientists, um, English um, neuroscientists, um, and they told them, frankly, they didn't want to have anything to do with the project. Mm -hmm. Um, they thought Oliver was um, like uh, just the most completely dishonest person we'd ever met. And as an example, they said, and this one said to, to Cantor, you know, I saw him at a conference here in London um, and he came sort of slightly out of breath up to the podium and a little bit sweaty, saying he was very, very sorry, um, but he'd arrived late. Um, he'd left his briefcase um, in a cab um, and therefore he was going to have to give this speech extemporaneously. Whereupon this particular person who was telling the story got up and left in a rage because he had been in a conference in Boston two years earlier when Oliver had come, rushed up to the podium, a little bit sweaty and said, I'm terribly sorry. I just rushed out of a cab. I left my speech in the cab and I'm afraid I'm going to have to do this extemporaneously. And this to this man seemed to be, you know, sort of the, the complete proof that everything Oliver did or said was complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so that, that strain kind of remained. And, you know, but having said that, that was really, that was a kind of, that was the fringe Oliver. Mm -hmm. um, and not the, not the Oliver in the center of the story. Um, so, you know, it's sort of wonderful that he retained that kind of, it's not irascibility, but that, that unreliability. Um, of a certain kind that kept his, you know, kept people on their toes. And, and yet when he was, so in, in the one time that I, I had the pleasure of working with him scientifically, where we did, we did this case study uh, for musicophilia of a patient uh, with a, a semantic dementia, an inability basically to, to remember concepts, but who retain uh, the ability to sing. <laughs> so the vocabulary is impoverished in speech, but the person was able to sing, you know, all of these complex things. And so we were, and, and looking back on, you know, his observations and what, you know, I remember several Several times, you know, Kate reached out and said, is this accurate? I mean, it was like every T was crossed, every I was dotted. And, you know, there was, and we, you know, we, we, we looked very carefully to make sure it was all very, very accurate. And even when I read any of his work that I have, even the, the, the slightest knowledge, even when I have deep knowledge of it, I'm always, I'm I always found it remarkable that he would be able to capture, you know, the precise, correct, current, interpretation of whatever it is that he's talking about, you know, whether it's memory. None of the people he wrote about it ever called him out and said, you know, well, that's not me. Yeah. On the contrary, like Temple Grandin, they said it really kind of blew my mind. He got my inner life. He got who I was better than anybody ever has. So that thing he was using the Sachs Hubble telescope to, to aim at had remarkable power and focus and got something which, you know, the, the proof was always in the patients and the colleagues who saw what he saw so accurately. So I just want to remind I, our audience. If I, may, oh, sorry. If, I may, if I may something quickly in Oliver's defense, um, he did indeed lose things all the time. All the time. <laughs> in, in fact, in his last year, you know, he's so well known for the three beautiful essays in the New York Times. But um, he published a number of other pieces and he also started a number of pieces that he didn't finish or didn't publish. And there was one piece, Kate and I know about this, called The Abyss. And The Abyss is about the phenomenon of Oliver losing things every day. Glasses, keys, notepads, speeches. They would just disappear and he felt they went into the abyss. And they were just gone forever. And then he would be delighted and surprised when either Kate or I, or maybe another assistant or Yolanda would find his glasses or keys or notepad. So um, I think it was also part of his eccentricity and his deep thinking that he would actually lose things. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. We were both chuckling at that, uh, but I, it, it's very possible that those two events literally did occur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was so anxious when he had to speak in front of an audience that, um, we, we had to go through all, all kinds of ways to sort of calm him down. Um, so it's, it's, I can well imagine that happening. 
And I, and I think part of that is because when he was focused, he it was all in that present moment. And there was no yeah. this like, let's get just keep track of things that I need to get done. Like, no, 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 no. Like, this is the moment that I'm focused on, which is one of the reasons I feel like he could be the, the Hubble telescope. He could have he could put all his powers of observation into the moment when the rest of us are thinking about whether or not we should get lunch or we're going to be late. Right. And I think that those two things, I mean, in the beginning, Andrew, you, you sort of, you know, alluded to, you know, his ability to sort of ignore you completely. Um, and I found that, you know, in the first day, the first time we interviewed Oliver, the, the, the interview lasted five days, um, <laughs> Monday through Friday, February 9th to February 13th, you know, nine to nine, you know, nine to five. And he just ran rings around us. And I asked him this very fancy ass question on the first day. Um, and, you know, it was, I quoted a Robert Lowell poem, History, which begins, history has to live with, with what was here, clutching and close to fumbling all we had. Unlike writing, life never finishes. So that was my incredibly pretentious way of like introducing the idea that here's a man who's dying, his life is ending, but he's also writing, and the writings can't ever get the fact that the life is finishing. Not a fucking word from Oliver at that question. So I'm like blushing across the table and going like, you know what, this guy's really self-absorbed. That was really kind of like a really pretentious question. But, you know, so Monday becomes Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Late on Friday afternoon, Oliver says, as if you were just responding to the question, you know, Rick, we are talking about autobiography and how it is the case, as Lowell said, that unlike writing, life never finishes. <laughs> I realized that it wasn't some kind of massive pathologically narcissistic self-absorption, but that he was taking the question and he was focusing on it, focusing the telescope and thinking and coming back to it. And when he finally had something that he felt he could say, then he was going to say it. And that for me was like the coup de grace. That for me was like, I mean, I had long since lost, I mean, forgotten the Monday thing, but it was just so striking to me to see the unusual temporality, which was Oliver. Um, and that, you know, to be sure, you had to march to the beat of his drummer. But his drummer was there for you in spades. Um, and I just, you know, I, I found that incredibly moving. So one of our viewers and any others who want to, uh, please please feel free to put questions up for us. Um, Alan Hauser uh, asks about the Jello scene uh, that it reveals a man who wasn't afraid to say what's on his mind. Um, was this just typical Oliver? There must be other stories. So was there <laughs> a cut from the film or Kate or Bill? Do you want to add to any other moments like that? Um, <laughs> I would say that there were many moments like that in, in within a very small circle. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I could tell at the moment that he was about to say that, you know, he would just get this glint in his eye and I, I'm thinking, Oh no, please no. <laughs> and <He's amazing. laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know, he, he was going to say something provocative, but he, he was that very fascinating combination of it deeply shy person who would overshare like crazy with with the those of us who are who are close and sometimes even <laughs> just strangers so um, i really love i really love how rick's camera and how rick himself captures oliver in that moment you can see the wheels turning him thinking him <laughs> weighing whether he should say this but he had enough naughtiness in him to know it would be provocative and and get a laugh, and uh, I love that whole scene. It's sort of stretched you know, out. The, you know, I, you know, no one will ever forget Orange Jello. Um, don't think of it. <laughs> but what I really love about it, I mean, it's incredibly funny. Is you know, there's no reason to point a camera at something if you're just going to get the sheer image of it. It's what's going on inside. Yeah. And you know, Billy appears in the film. My favorite scenes of Billy, I mean, he speaks so beautifully and eloquently about Oliver. Um, but most, very often, the camera finds um, Billy kind of leaning against the wall and sort of smiling incredibly beautifully. Um, you can feel what's going on in him or is a little shake of the head. And this jello moment 
you know, with Oliver's kind of got his head down looking away and to be sure the camera is seeing what's, what we're seeing a man being himself on the inside. And Billy yeah. says, what are you thinking about Oliver? And Oliver says, oh, I dare say, oh yes, I'll tell you. And then he tells his story. And, I, and, and that for me is like worth like a million dollars in every, any amount of time I've spent with anything because that is something which as Christoph Koch says later about Oliver's writings, you know, that captures something that's real about the interiority, the inner, inner life of a man that will be true and revealing a thousand years from now. And there's no other way to get it. So I just go like, you know, thank God we had the enormous privilege of being there. Um, and that Oliver had the enormous strength amidst, amidst his cohort to <laughs> be himself and let who he is show and shine. And I, I, I just want to make a oh, quick comment about, about that scene and um, the beauty of Rick's, Rick Burns's film, how it then very delicately segues into this gorgeous, delicate scene with Oliver observing an orangutan. Mm -hmm. And the score, the score of this film is also extremely beautiful. And it's just so subtle, the way it goes from that kind of provocative, story to um, something much more subtle about Oliver as an observer and empath with um, a fellow creature, an orangutan. Yeah, and it reminded me of, um, of, of one of the times where he was with a patient in my presence. This was patient LF, uh, which I just talked about a minute ago. And in, in the semantic dementia um, <clears throat> syndrome, one of the other things that happens is that these patients become somewhat obsessive about certain things, especially things that give pleasure. Uh, so eating, for example, is, is something that they like to do. And uh, there was a plate of cookies on the table and Oliver was the first to notice that some of the patient's uh, odd mo motor movements were directing him towards the cookie plate without any else really noticing you know and he would and so and and so Oliver took the cookie plate and was like here have a cookie <laughs> and the patient you know ate the cookie and was happy about it and they immediately bonded in that moment um because Oliver himself was known to stash a cookie in in a <laughs> uh, <laughs> or something cheese maybe more than cookies but um <laughs> or, uh, sardines um but <laughs> Anyway, so that's, yeah, that, I, I feel like that was very typical Oliver. It was in that, in that story, that scene, Rick, where I suddenly felt like, you know, this was such an intimate glance into a person that, you know, that, that, yeah, there's like, there's no, that, that to me was just so quintessential. And so, um, you know, his subject was consciousness. That yeah. was, that was what he was interested in, um, obsessively all his life. I mean, and he, you know, um, you know, as T.S. Eliot said, you know, poetry is not, you know, um, the expression of personality. It's an escape from personality, but only those who have personality know what it is, wish, is to wish to escape it. Mm -hmm. and so Oliver had that very complicated relationship with his own interiority. And, you know, we can't see it. It's the most intimate thing. There you are, Andre. Mm -hmm. You're in there. Mm -hmm. I know you're in there, but you're the only one having that experience, which is true of all of us. And Oliver was obsessed from childhood with this marvelous, frightening, wondrous reality that each of us, you know, has been gifted with this interior experience. And that his work was doing everything he could to bridge um, consciousnesses, which were inevitably, you know, inevitably separate. And that... That, that's the kind of miraculous thing. And that's where art, you know, I think one might say that art is the science of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. on how do you make objective this experience, which is in otherwise visible only in kind of fleeting moments, blinking eyes or nodding heads, but you don't know what the person's feeling like on the inside. Yeah. And Oliver wanted to know what you were feeling like on the inside. You who had encephalitis lethargica, or you who had autism, or you who is the man who mistook his wife for a hat. It wasn't the scientists kind of merely, I don't want to say merely, but sort of objective scientific, like what happened, how did it come? But as he said, what he, where his work existed was at the intersection of biography and biology. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a remarkable sort of um, degree of self-understanding of exactly the acute point of focus that he wanted to bring his own um, instrument um, into relationship with. And, and also this didn't become obvious to me until I was directing the opera, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And I, there's this monologue scene where, where the, the character playing um, Dr. S talks about how neurology focuses on deficits and disorders. And I, and I had created these projections where you would see these words um, all going off one another. There's my, there's my <laughs> Oliver Sacks portrayal. And, um, I just remember thinking like this, that, that was a profound shift in how we think about neurology because he really set in motion this whole um, sort of subfield of looking at the what, what remains or what is gained or like we can call it paradoxical facilitation or uh, just what, what we can learn from how brains are different when they are subjected to you know, damage or degeneration or, or just differences. Um, and I felt like, yeah, the film really showed that clearly too. Uh, but I that way in which that way in which having been rejected and ignored by so much of neuroscience, finally, like the superstars of late twentieth century um, neuroscience, Francis Crick, his mm -hmm. protege um, Christoph Koch, Gerald Edelman, and more, mm -hmm. Antonio Damasio later, mm -hmm. you know, who are now they are making subjectivity and consciousness and its experience their focus. And sure enough, what do they find? They find in Oliver's work, this remarkable database. So there's Francis Crick and Christoph reaching out to Oliver in the late eighties and nineties saying, you wrote in your first book, Migraine, um, about what it was like to have vision go from being this continuous movie-like kind of smooth motion to a series of static frames mm -hmm. um, showing because Crick and Christoph Koch we're beginning to think of the way in which vision was not just a given, but was something which was constructed out of a series of static percepts, frame by frame by frame, and the brain would analyze the difference among frames, just the way a movie camera works, and those differences would be motion. What a remarkable thing. So here he is providing not just a kind of like anecdotal subjective, you know, sort of data, but he's actually spurring the theoretical insights or certainly confirming the theoretical insights of people who are doing the cutting edge neuroscience of the late 20th and early 20th, 21st century. Thank you, Oliver Sacks. That's kind of a wonderful contribution. Yeah, I mean, even if you look at the whole, you know, way of, of talking about neurodivergences and Steve Silberman's writing on neurotribes, I mean, all of that comes from the early work that he did, um, you know, that was well beyond before his time when we talk about yeah, just this, this huge cultural change. So, um, you know, I think it's his, his influence is, is really much more widespread than I think people, uh, you know, understand. But one, one thing that you didn't cover in, in, in as much, which I really associated with him very strongly was his, you, you mentioned it a little bit in the film, but his love of plants, especially fern, right. ancient right. plants. Yeah, and I wondered if that's something that you felt like you needed to cut or, I mean, it just, it was, might have been something that hit the cutting room floor. Um, yeah. Robert Crowlich had a remarkable story um, that he, memory where he said he came into Oliver's apartment right there in Billy's living room. Um, and uh, Oliver was gently stroking um, a tiny, um, uh, I think it was a piece of fern. Um, and, and Robert said, what are you doing, Oliver? <laughs> Oliver said, shh. It's purring. <laughs> you know, so there was that quality of like, you know, everything was fascinating to Oliver. And that, you know, Christoph Koch said so powerfully, we didn't use this in the film, but in the sense the film is undergirded by this. Christoph said, who's a remarkable uh, neuroscientist, the head of Paul Allen's Brain Institute, um, that there were really three fundamental questions which science, science addresses. Why is there anything? Mm -hmm. Why is the world? Why is there life? And what is, where, how has consciousness come about? Mm -hmm. And that those were the three, they're all conjoined. They're all, as Chris Hopp points out, they're, they're, they're questions of genesis. How does something, how do these things come into being? And Oliver's 
entire life and entire work was dedicated to a kind of an inquest into all these things, hence the chemistry, hence the botany and the biology, and hence the neurology and this obsession with consciousness, because he knew that in some sense, they were all comp very complicatedly interknit. Um, and what a remarkable act of kind of synthesis um, for him to have given to the world and without any of the complexity that I'm giving it, I mean, or pseudo complexity. I mean, this was what he was, this is what he was after and why he knew that there was really no, at the end, sharp divisions between physics, biology, and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Kate, do you think later on in his life, he felt like his curiosity was sated? Because he always struck me as the kind of person who was just infinitely curious and that that must at some point just feel <laughs> unsatisfying. He, if you're... He, it, it, no, he, he was infinitely curious. That's exactly right. And it, 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 during the last few months of his life, he was investigating uh, eyes in different different <laughs> animals throughout the animal kingdom. What what is a jellyfish's eye? What is a you know cuttlefish's eye? And this went back to to something that he began interrogating when he was 15 years old in biology class. We found the notebook that that talks about this. Um, he, he, he's, he wrote and he often said that the thing he was sorry about in terms of dying was not knowing these wonderful new scientific breakthroughs that would happen after his death. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was curious about everything, everyone uh, endlessly. And I, I think that, you know, it's a sort of a childlike quality that many of us damp down, but but he never, never did that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the joy of reading his books. Billy, Billy, describe what you found in um, so many of the volumes in the Oliver's 10,000 volume library after he died. Yeah, about six months after his death, I began dealing with and sorting the almost 10,000 books in this apartment uh, and in his office books on every wall of this apartment, um, books that had been organized by subject matter, which I had lived with for six years. But once I began taking them down and fanning the pages, finding really to my surprise that thousands of them had been heavily annotated in the margins, Oliver really in dialogue with the authors. And I'm talking about Darwin, Freud, Kierkegaard, all the philosophers. Um, I think Oliver himself didn't really even remember that he had done this. Um, sure, maybe every now and then I would see this in a book that I'd pull off his shelf, but I had no idea the extent. You can see here how he's actually talking to the book, talking to the author, disagreeing. Um, here it is with Freud or a book about Freud. Um, yeah, it was really one of the great delights. One of the uh, amazing things is how I've continued to get to know Oliver even since his death. And uh, I think as Kate said, when I met Oliver, as Kate did, I'd never met anyone so interesting in my whole life. And um, I can say the same thing um, today, five years after his death, I've never met anyone as interesting, as amazing, as curious as Oliver Sacks. Um, and speaking to the question of his curiosity, I think it says everything about Oliver that the last trip he took on this planet, this beautiful planet, one month before he died, was he took me to a lemur preserve in North Carolina at Duke University. Um, a, a academic you know, research facility, a preserve for lemurs, the largest outside of Madagascar, which he had been to once before. He had a great love for primates and interest in primates and lemurs. And um, where do you go a month before you die? Not to a Caribbean an island, not to Paris, not to Amsterdam. You go to humid, hot uh, North Carolina where we spent a whole day trekking around this amazing, magical, fascinating lemur preserve. And he was peppering the scientists and veterinarians and primatologists with questions about these lemurs. He knew almost as much as they did. And he was ill at that point. You know, it was an exhausting day. By the end of the day, he collapsed in the hotel room but um, he loved it. 
And um, that was the last trip that we made together. Mm -hmm. The lemur colony. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of makes sense, you know, that or, you know, yeah. where there's a fern that, you know, is very rare. Um, uh, you know, it, it was it was wonderful to see the the, the footage too of him swimming, as I remember when he came to visit San Francisco, we had to figure out where he could swim and, and swimming was a, was a part of the schedule that, you know, was very important. And to find out actually that's where he does some of his best thinking, all of a sudden it made a lot of sense. I mean, I, I just thought it was just an activity that he enjoyed and, you know, also it's like cold. And so there's like, he, yeah, there's like the eccentricity, and, you know, the kind of people who swim in open ocean are special kind of people. Um, and. And yet that's, you know, yeah, that, that was interesting to hear that the sea, that that's actually where he, he did so much thinking. You know, I mean, I think there was, there was swimming and there was writing mm -hmm. um, and they were, they were really kind of in sync. Um, and I think he felt that in a way thinking was the greatest form of creativity, mm -hmm. um, more even than the writing. Mm -hmm. um, and each involves this extraordinary kind of, you know, energetic oh. flow. And Paul through, you'll remember this Andre in the film, you know, says towards the end of the film, Paul was a great friend of his, you know, um, saw him just 10 days before he died. And Oliver, um, he found Oliver in his living room and his character was posed behind his desk and he said, Oliver, what are you doing? And Oliver said, I'm writing about creativity. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and that sense of, you know, the ceaselessness of that, you know, energy to express and understand, um, was really, I think, unsurpassed. Certainly, I've never met or known anybody who had that quality, quite in that abundance. So we have Kate uh, and, and Bill to thank for all the posthumous uh, writing that we get uh, out of, out of, out of um, you know, what, what was left over. And, you know, I think we are all so grateful to, to both of you for doing that. Carol Simpson asks, is there any B-roll or footage that Rick, you might share uh, with this demanding public? Well, it's funny you should say that. Um, I think yes in two ways. Um, one, um, the Oliver Sacks Foundation will get all of our footage. And, you know, we have, you know, 90 some hours of footage with Oliver, you know, that February and in April and in June, and not just as an apartment, but in the Botanical Gardens and at Beth Abraham. Um, plus, there's the footage with, you know, 25 of the most remarkable people that my colleagues and I have ever met, you know, um, Christoph Koch or Shane Fistel, who's a Tourette from Toronto, um, and, and everybody in between. You know, what we really also have, um, so we'll retain, we will retain non-exclusive rights to use it, is to do a film about consciousness called The Hard Problem. Um, and a, a phrase of the Australian neuroscientist, uh, philosopher, David Chalmers, um, who to Christoph Koch's point that there are three fundamental problems that science addresses. The really hard one, mm -hmm. as hard as physics, as hard as life, is what are the coordinate, where does consciousness come from? And if God didn't give it to us, as Descartes thought it was, coming in through some kind of mysterious, you know, deus ex machina through the pineal gland, um, how does it emerge in us? And so this question, which is the, really the holy grail of science, the third of those questions, and Oliver's interviews um, are so, the footage is so filled with that, and so are the thoughts of so many of the people, and so we're going to do a film called The Hard Problem, in which it'll be sort of Oliver part two, um, and um, and then the rest of it will be, you know, there in the in the Oliver Sacks Foundation archives for perpetuity. Yeah, because A River of Consciousness, if I'm remembering correctly, was published posthumously. So we never got to see Oliver talking about it. That's right. But it was really that was his that was his story. That was his subject. So Kate, how can people who want to stay in touch uh, about Oliver, what should they is there a mailing list of the Oliver Sacks Foundation? What what should they do? We have a, a newsletter that goes out every once in a while and we have something interesting to tell people. And you can find that at oliversacks.com. Uh, you can also find out anything to do with this movie at oliversacksduck.com. Um, but both of those sites talk to each other. So, so uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of, of great information there about all of his books. And we're working on a revamp of that website. So we're hoping to have some fun surprises 
in a few months time. And that's dog like D-O-C, not D-U-C-K, which it could be, it's Oliver. Yes, D-O-C like documentary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if in doubt, oliversacks.com will take you both places. Plus and you can um, follow Oliver Sacks Foundation on Twitter and Instagram. Those are really wonderful. They're really wonderful social media accounts. Great. Well, I'm gonna turn it back to Kate McKay. Thank you. I, I would just like to thank everyone so much for your participation today. Thank you, Rick, for a brilliant film. Um, mm -hmm. If you Again, if you haven't seen it, you can watch it at bandpfa.org or ma many other cinemas across, across the country. It, it's really just a remarkably rich portrait of an amazing human being and super inspiring. And it's great to get to meet Kate and Bill through the film. And thanks very much, Indre. It's one, you did a wonderful job moderating. I was, mm -hmm. I've been, been looking forward to this conversation so much. So it did, and it did not disappoint. So thanks. It was the best interview that I've ever <laughs> had the good portion of being involved with. <laughs> well, thank you so much to all of you. I just, I, I mean, I wish we could chat all night about, about yeah. Oliver and his, and, but hopefully when you have your next film on consciousness, we'll have, we can have That's even right. more conversation. Right. Thank so. you. Thank you for having us. Oh, no, thank, thanks very much. Thanks for being here. Yeah, we can all go pet our ferns. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing.